I'm your host, Chasm Fields, <laughs> and I am a developer advocate at Google Cloud, where I focus on Google Kubernetes Engine and open source Kubernetes. I'm also a co-chair of the Special Interest Group for Contributor Experience in Open Source Kubernetes, so if you're interested in contributing, you're welcome to come find me. Uh, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador, and I am presenting with... Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm also a software engineer at Google, and I work on both GKE and Kubernetes. Um, I am a Kubernetes SIG storage TL. And since Michelle is a SIG storage TL, we're really going to dive into it today. But first, let's start at the high level. Today, we are going to be talking about stateful. You all know what that means, right? Who wants to give me a definition? Anyone? Right after snack, anybody want to talk? <laughs> no? All right. A lot of folks aren't quite sure what stateful means. I know that I wasn't, and I think it depends on the context in a lot of ways. Um, so I became really interested in this and trying to figure out what exactly stateful means. And I started exploring it in Kubernetes. So what does running a stateful workload in Kubernetes mean? And this is kind of what I've come up with so far. From Kubernetes' perspective, everything has state. The only difference is whether or not anything cares about that state. So the features in Kubernetes that you'll find to support stateful workloads are really all about dependencies. Your workload is running in Kubernetes, something cares about what it's doing. So you're connecting it maybe to a database, you're connecting it to some other application within your architecture that needs to know what it's doing or needs to read its data. And so you have all of these connections and that is what makes your workload stateful from Kubernetes perspective. And my interest in this started last year at the Kubernetes Contributor Summit where we had an open space talking about stateful workloads on Kubernetes and in that open space, uh, the leader of it showed this slide where he kind of laid out what he thought a stateful workload in Kubernetes was. And what struck me about this was that it doesn't mention storage basically at all. It mentions persistent volumes once <laughs> in a sub bullet. <laughs> and I was like, how is it stateful if you're not even talking about storage? <laughs> so today we're gonna dive into some of the uh, features that Kubernetes has been working on and has today for running stateful workloads, and we're gonna see how this works. But first, let's talk a little bit about workloads on Kubernetes. As you probably know, I imagine most of you are running uh, workloads on Kubernetes today. There are a variety of different ways that Kubernetes can run workloads. Um, the different types of workloads that Kubernetes runs are deployments, daemon sets, jobs, cron jobs, and stateful sets. And so only one of these has stateful in the name, but in reality, we see that many stateful workloads are run using different types of workloads within Kubernetes, not just stateful sets. Um, but let's dive into stateful sets for a second here. So why is a stateful set, why does it have stateful in the name? And the reason for that is that stateful sets have a sticky identity. They uh, provide a stable, unique network identifier, so those other pieces of your architecture that need to get to whatever's in that stateful workload, they can find it consistently. Um, they provide a stable, persistent storage uh, across uh, the whole workload, as I said on this slide, it's a volume per replica rather than uh, having one volume across all of the replicas like in a deployment. Um, it has features for ordered graceful deployment and scaling and also ordered automated rolling updates. So there are a few special features of stateful sets that are meant for these kinds of stateful workloads. But what kinds of workloads count as stateful? As I said, not all of them use stateful sets. Here are some examples. So one that I love to point out is WordPress. WordPress is one of the, the favorites for tutorials for Kubernetes. Um, what I love about WordPress is that it was designed in a world where Kubernetes didn't exist and containers didn't exist. <laughs> and so it thinks that it's gonna have like a whole machine to itself. It's gonna have its own file system and it puts its data in really weird random places. Um, so it can actually be kind of tricky to run in Kubernetes because you have to make sure that you have all of your persistent volumes set up correctly uh, and, and are all working with it correctly. And also it has a database, so lots of connections, making it a stateful workload. But when you see those tutorials running WordPress and a lot of the use cases I've seen for WordPress on Kubernetes, run it as a deployment, not as a stateful set. Uh, another use case that I really enjoy is game servers. 
If you've ever heard of Agones, it's an open source project specifically for running game servers on Kubernetes. Uh, and it does that by providing custom resource definitions. There's a custom resource uh, that Agones provides that is called a game server. So it doesn't use any of the above, it uses its own. Uh, things that deal intricately with data, of course, like databases, do actually tend to use uh, stateful sets or they might use a custom resource definition. And also AIML workloads are usually jobs, but they are also generally considered stateful. So there are a few specific challenges that we see come up again and again with these stateful workloads. For one, maintaining a consistent identity, um, often for connection to other services, and also high and consistent availability, which deals with things like upgrades, um, making sure that one thing is ready before a different thing, and also uh, making sure that they have complete start and end processes. Sometimes stateful workloads need a little bit longer to spin down all of those connections gracefully. So how does Kubernetes help with this? Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, a number of various different uh, features available in Kubernetes to help you uh, deploy and manage your stateful workloads um, and how, to, how they help um, address a lot of these challenges. So first, um, with de deployment, we of course have stateful set and deployments and jobs and all of those workload controllers, and we are continuing to make improvements in those areas. Um, as an example, uh, with stateful set, we recently added the ability to have uh, persistent volume deletion policies. So when you scale down your stateful set or when you delete your stateful set, you have the option to be able to clean up those volumes as well. Um, but there's more challenges to consider beyond just deployment. Um, you need to consider things like HA, data migration, backup, security, just to name a few things. And this is where custom resources and operators have really changed the game for stateful workloads. Um, good operators are able to automate these complex workflows, which are often very application specific, and they're able to simplify the user experience at the same time. So you can find, um, you can pretty much find operators for a lot of the most popular open source stateful workloads today, including Postgres, MySQL, Kafka, and Redis, just to name a few. Um, the next challenge is storage, obviously. Um, the stateful workloads have to store their state somewhere, durable. And storage is a bit overloaded. Um, it can mean a lot of things, ranging from databases to object storage to persistent volumes and, and file and block storage. Um, in Kubernetes, the concept of persistent volumes refers to mount-based storage systems which are typically provided by file and block storage systems, but um, you know, it is possible to write fuse adapters for other kinds of systems like object storage as well. And to accommodate this uh, wide range of different systems, one of the uh, most important uh, enhancements that we've made in Kubernetes is the, Kuber uh, is the container storage interface, also known as CSI. This is a standardized um, API definition where storage vendors can write drivers against, and then um, people can install those drivers into their Kubernetes cluster and be able to access those storage systems using the same persistent volume APIs. And today we have over 100 different CSI drivers across all the major uh, cloud and on-prem storage vendors today. Um, this has made it practically, um, or this has made it possible to run stateful workloads in practically any Kubernetes environment today, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. Um, and you're able to use all the, um, you're able to use a lot of features like dynamic provisioning, resizing, snapshot, and cloning all through the same portable persistent volumes API. Um, okay, next I wanna talk about disruption management, which I think is one of the hardest problems of uh, running a stateful workload in production. And um, first, let's concentrate on unplanned failures. 
um, to handle unplanned failures, you want to um, be sure to deploy your workload across multiple failure domains um, to sort of uh, reduce the blast radius of, of, say, a zone failure or a rack failure, for example. And in Kubernetes, um, the way to do that is to specify pod topology spreading constraints. Um, with a, when you specify this, you basically give it a topology key, which is a label representing your fault domain, whether it's a rack or a node or a zone. And then you can also specify um, policies on how evenly spread you want all of your replicas to be across each of those zones. And um, for those of you who have uh, used Kubernetes in the past, you might be feel familiar with pod anti-affinity. Um, this to pod to topology uh, spreading constraints is essentially a um, newer version of pod anti-affinity. It's, it's a replacement and it's, um, it's a lot more powerful because with pod anti-affinity, um, what ha actually happened was that you had to have only one replica per domain. There wasn't a way to say like, I want two or three replicas per domain. And so with pod topology constraints, um, you can actually uh, have, have those kinds of policies. So it's a lot more flexible. And so the next thing to consider is um, protecting your stateful workloads from noisy neighbor issues. And there are two ma main ways to go about this. One, if your workload is mission critical enough, then you should strongly consider just dedicating an entire node just to run those, um, those workloads. And so you can use node affinity to uh, basically direct that workload to only run on that set of nodes. And you can use that in combination with uh, node taints in order to prevent other workloads from being scheduled on those nodes. Um, but if you do want to end up sharing nodes, then the um, things I would suggest that you do are first to um, set the priority class on your pod and make sure it's an appropriate um, level of criticalness. That way, uh, if the node is full of pods, um, then Kubernetes can evict lower priority pods to make room for your high, higher priority workload. And the next, alongside that, um, you should be specifying your pod's resource requirements like CPU and memory in the pod spec. Because when a Kubernetes node is under resource pressure, it's gonna be looking for pods to evict from it and it's gonna first pick the ones that haven't requested anything. And so it's uh, pretty important to uh, specify your resource requirements and your priority classes for, for this reason. Um, so then moving on to plan disruptions. These are events like doing a rolling update of your application, doing a Kubernetes node upgrade, or um, doing a auto, auto scale down, for example. And a lot of stateful workloads um, need to maintain a minimum number of replicas in order to maintain quorum. And so you wanna specify those requirements in a pod disruption budget. Um, Kubernetes is going to look at pod disruption budgets when it does um, handle these planned maintenance events like upgrades. And if, uh, and, and basically the eviction request is first gonna evaluate this pod disruption budget and see if it's safe to disrupt one of your pods. Um, and if it's not safe, so if disrupting one of your pods is gonna bring down the number of healthy replicas below the threshold, that you specified in the pod disruption budget, then Kubernetes is gonna reject that eviction request. So um, this is basically a, a very critical um, method that you, sh you should do in order to maintain quorum. And then um, similarly, uh, pod disruption budgets leverage um, basically the pod readiness status in order to, to determine if that pod is healthy. So being able to set the appropriate uh, readiness probes on your pod is also another important um, consideration. And then now when your pod is finally shutting down, you want to make sure that it can shut down gracefully um, in, in a timely manner. So um, first, you'll want to make sure to set 
your graceful termination period to the amount of time it will take to gracefully shut down your pod. And, um, and then that's where, um, and then also specify a, a SIG, either a pre-stop hook or a SIG term handler in your pod um, to be able to get that signal of when Kubernetes is tr trying to uh, shut down your pod. And then in that pre-stop hook, you can do all the things you need to do to, to gracefully terminate, um, such as flushing all the data to disk, closing your connections, and potentially you know, failing over if you're currently the leader, for example. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, it's vitally important to plan and design your application for regular maintenance and upgrades. Um, I think in, in this age when there's just every day there's new bugs and new CVEs being reported, um, you, you need to get into the flow of doing regular updates and making sure that your application is tuned to be able to handle that. And so the, at least from what I've seen, the most successful stateful workloads running in production are the ones that have been designed and built a, around a lot of these uh, paradigms today. And we know that especially for stateful workloads, upgrades are scary to do, but we're doing our best to make them better as much as we can. <laughs> All right. Um, so now, so, so that was basically an overview a lot of, of a lot of the most um, common features that you'll want to leverage for your stateful workloads. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about now about future um, enhancements and features that we're working on um, that will help in this space. Um, so, f and, and these are features that you should be on the lookout for and if any of them sound um, interesting to you, um, you know, definitely join one of the SIGs and, and bring it up during discussions and you know, help give feedback and, and contribute to these features. So first in uh, Kubernetes 129, which is coming out very shortly, um, we're introducing a new alpha feature to be able to modify volumes. Um, so this will help with use cases like performance tuning, where you want to be able to increase, you want to be, be able to basically scale up your performance over time. And you can do things like increase your IOPS or increase your throughput on those volumes. Um, and then beyond that, we have a number of features that are in active discussion or prototyping right now. Um, first is a stateful set volume expansion. This is gonna let you um, basically expand your volumes through the stateful set templates instead of having to modify the persistent volumes directly today. Um, we also have group volume snapshots, which is going to let you take snap a consistent set of snapshots over a set of volumes. Um, and then cross namespace snapshots, which will let you specify a, a snapshot source and be able to share that across multiple namespaces. And so those are all kind of enhancements around um, the storage layer. And then around um, disruption management and handling, there's a, a couple things in discussion. First is declarative node maintenance. And so this uh, feature is going to provide a, um, a better signal to workloads that a node is going to go down for maintenance or for upgrades. And um, because today, basically, workloads, the only signal they get is they either get their pre-stop hook um, that is, um, they, they, they either get the pre-stop hook or their SIG term handler, which is pretty late into the cycle. Um, this feature is going to explore ways to um, basically have like a new object where Kubernetes can signal its intent to about to, um, you know, initiate a node maintenance. And then their workloads or operators can look at that intent and then do a little more prep preparatory steps to um, handle that. Um, the other thing in, in discussion right now is to be able to do topolo topology aware disruptions. Um, and so this would basically enable the ability to speed up your upgrades and be able to do basically upgrade your replicas zone by zone. 
um, but still be able to maintain you know, availability of having two out of three zones up. And so that's all of um, the most interesting features that are going on in the Kubernetes space. Um, in the DOK space, there's also a couple of um, interesting uh, projects that are going on. First is the operator feature matrix. Um, this is gonna basically help people decide which operator is gonna be a, the best fit for them by um, kind of having a one place where people can see all the operators that are available for a particular work, workload and then decide based on that feature matrix what is a good fit. And so we're starting with Postgres um, currently and we'll be adding more workloads um, as, as time goes on. And then the next, um, the next development is the security hardening guide. And so this is gonna provide a lot of best practices mostly related to security and how to configure and um, operate you know, stateful workloads in a secure way. Um, this guide is also in, in active development right now and will be uh, published um, in the coming months. And so, yeah, in general, if um, any of these are interesting to you, um, please join you know, Kubernetes SIG discussions and join the DOK um, discussions and there's Slack channels for all of them. And we definitely love to uh, you know, get all the uh, contributions and feedback from the community on these. Cool, and I will bring us home a reminder of best practices. So some of the best practices that we wanna remind you of are one, use the aforementioned features. We hope you found them interesting um, and will consider using them in your workloads. For upgrades, as I said, we know that they're really hard. Of course, for stateful workloads, blue-green strategies tend to work best, um, where you have the workload and you spin it up alongside it and then you can switch over when you're ready. Um, chaos testing. If you haven't looked into chaos testing for your stateful workloads, it is something that you may want to look into. Make sure to take regular backups. Backups both of the data and of the config of the workload and actually test your recovery procedures. Novel concepts. <laughs> Everyone has recovery procedures, but do you know if they work? Uh, CICD best practices generally apply and general Kubernetes best practices around security and networking apply. So we hope you've learned a few things today. Um, for one, that Stateful is more than just databases, though we are at Data on Kubernetes Day, so I mean, that's kind of a big one. Um, also, one thing that I really hope you all take away from here is that Kubernetes sees a workload as uh, Stateful if it is something where something else cares about its state. Uh, Kubernetes provides primitives for app lifecycle, storage, scheduling, and graceful disruption management. One reason I wanted to give this talk is that all of the stateful features in Kubernetes are not listed as stateful. You go and look for, for stateful on Kubernetes, you're not gonna find a, a page that has just all of these things listed. So here are some of the types of problem areas that you'll wanna look for in the docs in order to find stateful features. Uh, a good quality operator can simplify and manage complex day two workloads, uh, workflows for your workloads and design your application with modern best practices as much as you can. Thank you very much for joining us today. This QR code will take you to the forum to give us feedback and I hope you will. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for the group? Write it. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question. So we um, have a platform that deploys um, transient pods um, pretty frequently at a large scale. And um, so we have um, the pods running um, sometimes like for several hours, like, but like there is a, um, a small uh, lifespan for each uh, pod. So we have pre-stop hooks, sick terms, um, and PDB um, anti-affinity um, all applied um, as mentioned in the best practices. Uh, but one of the, the big issues that we often face is um, natively transferring state from once a pod terminates, right? So it's pretty difficult. So when we are providing a platform um, for users to deploy pods, um, each application developer has to take ownership about like maintaining their state and the way that they recover. 
um, which is a pretty difficult um, thing to apply at scale. Um, so um, a native uh, pod state transfer um, would be um, uh, a lot more um, useful if there is uh, ability for stating, uh, st transferring state directly uh, from a pod that gets terminated due to cluster upgrades or um, resource um, issues to another pod. Is there anything in the works uh, for something like this? And um, any advice? Sure, I can take that. Um, I think to uh, basically handle that case, I think um, this is where the storage layer comes into pl play. And um, I think for that, I think the challenge is, is there's a lot of different requirements uh, depending on the workload. And so that's something you'll need to consider is um, do you want sort of one storage solution that can handle all of the different use cases that you can have and with one one general solution could, could maybe handle everything, but maybe may not be the most cost effective options. And so those are kind of trade offs you'll have to make, um, you know, in terms of like manageability, ease of manageability versus um, kind of tuning your um, tuning your costs. So it sounds like essentially the use case is a batch workload where you have a lot of different workloads spinning up and you have storage attached to them and you need to be able to move storage from one to another one that's about to be running, right? Yeah, and it sounds like our recommendation from our expert is to look into different options at the storage level um, because there are different ways that you could do that regarding like how the storage itself works. So you'll have both of those components to look into, but um, that level. Anything at the Kubernetes level in particular? I think, um, I think for a lot of these um, kind of task-based workloads where like one task is handing off one um, you know, state to another task, uh, one of the interesting questions is gonna be um, how, what is the task-to-task -task relationship or, or what is the sharing relationship? Do you expect only one task to hand off to one task or do you expect like many tasks to hand off to many tasks or, or one to many or many to one? And so I think if the answer to your workflow is, has the word many in any of those scenarios, then I think using a storage layer that can provide read, write, many semantics is probably gonna be the best fit. So lots of interesting considerations here and details with this use case. Make sure to reach out to SIG storage and or uh, the batch working group, or are they SIG batch now? <laughs> batch in open source Kubernetes to give us more detail if you'd like to get more involved with what's going on in the process. All right, we have time for one more question. So you mentioned uh, setting pod disruption budgets for uh, graceful termination or like uh, uh, node upgrades and they're helpful. But, uh, but in a stateful set, um, does the API server also consider pod disruption budgets in case uh, pods are going over assigned resources, like out of memory, or um, so if like two pods of the stateful set are going out of memory simultaneously, is uh, and the pod disruption budget says you can only take down one, um, is that still considered and honored, or uh, that's something that the API server uh, doesn't honor at that? So point? if your workload is being affected by an error condition, mm -hmm. does the pod disruption budget still get implemented properly? I believe um, today we do not consider pod disruption budget when we're trying to, um, when when like a node is trying to evict pods due to uh, due to resource pressure. Um, I think that that is a gap. I think we could definitely consider improving in Kubernetes. Um, but I, I would say the best remedy for that is is to declare those pod resources and the priority classes of your pod. That way, those pods will be considered last in the um, eviction list. Set your resource requests and limits. Yeah. <laughs>